Let's uh, welcome Baron Rosen, Whitestone Communications. Just press this forward. That's it. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. This is uh, an exciting time to be here uh, talking about acquisitions, particularly in this building. As you know, uh, McGraw Hill was uh, bought, uh, they're starting the closing for McGraw Hill with uh, Apollo Global buying the company for $2.5 billion. So um, hopefully they'll deliver the money early so we can all try to uh, get our hands on it. I'm pleased to have uh, with me uh, two panelists. I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, before that, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Baron Rosen. I'm president of Whitestone Communications. We're a merger and acquisition advisory firm with a special focus in education. Uh, I personally also had a, a background in education, having done acquisitions here at McGraw-Hill, having worked in this building uh, about 20 years ago, and then uh, moving across the street to uh, Simon Schuster and helping them with acquisitions. So we uh, focus generally representing smaller companies, revenues of five to 30 million, and um, working with them to, to maximize value in the uh, selling process. And we also work with buyers to help them uh, with strategic acquisitions. And as um, Karen was mentioning, we're also publisher of the Who's Buying Whom report, uh, which is available here if you haven't got your copy. And uh, if they happen to run out, please let me know. And uh, we can get you uh, uh, copies of this report. It covers all the transactions in the education and school space uh, from 2008 uh, through to uh, June 2012. And we, we do this as an annual. So if you'd like to uh, make sure you're getting it on a regular basis, uh, just let us know and we'll make sure you're on the email list for, for that. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, ask my uh, two panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Diana Roden, would you like to go first? <laughs> Hello, my name is Diana Roten. I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer for Amplify, which is the new education business of the News Corp family. Hi, uh, I'm Atif Gilani, one of the founders and a partner at an education-focused private equity firm, Renovus Capital Partners. So I'm going to do a uh, brief uh, introduction, kind of a lay of the land of the uh, M&A market, and then ask our panelists to uh, take us in deeper as to uh, their views and what they see. Uh, this is uh, back to 2008. Uh, of course, we were on a, a, a very real uh, fiscal cliff uh, at that time, and we did take the dive off the cliff, as the New York Post uh, headline here shows. Although it was interesting, th this headline was actually not from 2008. It was from another panic. Prior, so I think there's a lesson in that, that these uh, panics come and go and uh, just have to hang in there. Uh, so things were pretty wild there for a time. We weren't sure if we were even going to have uh, financial markets. Uh, but as I was saying, the financial markets are like a roller coaster. Uh, they do uh, go down, but they also come back up. And right now, the uh, Standard & Poor's average is pretty much near where it was in 2007. So we are seeing a uh, much more optimistic uh, situation and a great situation for our acquisitions. So I'm going to take you through a few slides of numbers on the uh, market counting uh, number of deals and dollar value. Uh, just overall in the United States, this is not education, this is overall total uh, transactions. Uh, you can see the swoop uh, downward uh, with the recession behind that is the, uh, and the lighter type is the Standard & Poor's uh, stock average. So you can see what was happening in the stock market. Uh, acquisitions, we do tend to follow how the, the market is going. So you can see we took a, a swoop down, uh, but a big uh, significant rise, uh, particularly the last numbers for annualized uh, for 2012. It's almost a, um, what is that, 25% uh, increase in the number of transactions this year over last year overall. Uh, dollar value, uh, again, uh, going down in the recession, uh, coming back up strongly. Uh, in education, uh, we track the number of deals at Whitestone uh, doing this um, Who's Buying Whom report, and the numbers here reflect what uh, we've counted in the market and how we uh, identify education transactions. So again, you can see it's a great uh, curve upward, and uh, this year looks uh, particularly uh, strong. So what's driving this uh, increase in activity? Uh, there are three um, main uh, items that I want to cite. Uh, first of all, uh, public companies uh, 
tend to buy uh, at the wrong time. Public companies buy when things are going well and their stock prices are up uh, and they have um, optimistic outlooks as opposed to uh, during recessions. Um, I used to work, as I mentioned, at uh, two major companies, McGraw Hill and Simon and & Schuster, and as a CEO of a division, say of the education division, um, in, in a group, if your results were not doing well, you could not go in and ask for approval for an acquisition. Because they would say, well, look, your, your business is not doing well, how can we, we support you? And, and the reason your business might not be doing well would be to, due to the fact that, well, we're in a terrific recession. But they wouldn't take that as an excuse. So. Um, they wait until the CEO who's supporting the acquisition can come in and he can show an upward curve in his business. They say, okay, uh, your business is doing well, so we'll support you in acquisitions. Of course, that's going to be when everybody else is doing well and prices are up, but that's the way it works with the, the big companies. Um, the big companies laid off a lot of folks uh, during the recession, so as, the re as they came out of it and uh, started to generate higher sales, they were getting greater profits off those sales, greater productivity and therefore that led to huge uh, has led to them having huge cash reserves so they definitely have money to spend and are, are starting to do that and then you have the ongoing arbitrage of you know public company trading at a high multiple and they can go out and buy a company at a low multiple incorporate it into their earnings and get an automatic uh, pickup in their stock price the other major trend is and it was talked about uh, touched on a little bit earlier uh, private equity now is uh, very active a a as a buyer uh, for companies uh, in general and companies in this room. Uh, there are more private equity funds than ever, and they have more money to spend than ever. They also had money that they were sitting on uh, during the recession. Uh, they did not have uh, good opportunities to place that money, and so uh, there was kind of a, a backlog of money to be invested. Uh, so they have more money than ever to invest. And with this is great for, if you own a business, this is very good news for you because it creates increased competition for deals and it leads to higher prices. I talked to the head of one uh, private equity fund and he says that um, where he used to see four private equity funds uh, competing for a deal, he now sees 10. So that really drives the price. And in a transaction that we did um, in the past year, uh, we had uh, tremendous interest from the private equity funds and uh, towards the end, 80% uh, of our uh, final bidders were private equity funds and we only had one strategic. So um, it uh, shows that the private equity funds are really stepping up. Maybe Atif can uh, tell me if this statistic is correct, but I think the number I heard was that they account for 47% of all the transactions done in the U.S. today, either directly when they're buying it as a platform or as a fold into an existing portfolio company. And the final component is that the uh, funding is there for the acquisitions from the banks. Uh, this is particularly important to the private equity funds to be able to, to lever their deals. So the banks are back. So this is kind of a, a perfect world now for acquisitions. So th those were some of the, the macro factors. Uh, micro, just within education, uh, the biggest factor in my mind that seems to be driving um, the investor interest is the move to technology. Um, when education or well, publishing was more print and traditional, uh, you certainly didn't have uh, private equity funds knocking down the doors uh, to get into this field uh, due to all the um, uh, unfavorable cash flow characteristics of uh, print publishing. But now you have the new model, technology is the game changer. Uh, I heard. Um, one statistic that schools that more than 25 percent of money spent in schools is now spent on technology and as someone reminded me in a break uh, the state of florida has mandated that 50 percent of their state budget go towards technology so there's a lot of money uh, heading to technology and it is providing uh, investors an opportunity to invest in companies that have faster than uh, average market growth the technology companies can also have higher profit margins and of course better cash flow characteristics particularly with the subscription driven uh, technology uh, models. Here's some examples of some of the private equity transactions, uh, the major deals being done. Um, I mostly was looking towards the uh, larger transactions here. Um, going in uh, at the top has the uh, transaction I just uh, mentioned at the start. Apollo Global buying McGraw-Hill. 
Um, that deal was, of course, a long time in the making. I think it's been about a year uh, the, uh, ago that uh, McGraw-Hill said that uh, it was going to consider uh, a spinoff. And um, so it's going to be interesting to, to see how that develops and what impact it's going to have in the education market. <coughs> Toma Bravo, which uh, has a representative here at this conference, uh, made their uh, major uh, education acquisition in 2010, buying Plato Learning, paying $143 million for that. And then uh, this year, adding on Archipelago Learning, which they bought from Providence Equity, uh, paying uh, nearly $300 million for that business. Uh, Chicago Growth Partners uh, bought a they, they had been uh, prior owners of e-instruction and noble learning, and they uh, bought a company that uh, I'm glad to say Whitestone represented for sale teaching strategies in the early childhood market. Uh, Providence Equity has been a, a major player in education transactions, having bought Blackboard and also uh, this company in Italy, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce that name. Uh, among the strategics, I mean, the, the only strategic, really, uh, in a true sense, actively in the market now is Pearson. Uh, they've had a uh, fast uh, uh, draw on their checkbook, uh, ability to, to move quickly, and um, they just seem to be uh, all over the world globally uh, making acquisitions. You may have read that Pearson is considering divesting the Financial Times. Um, so they are going to really be a pure play education. That's where they're staking their future. And they're doing it in, in a big way. As you can see, um, I'm trying to remember this totals up yet to 1.6 billion just in the last 12 months. So pretty fast uh, run rate on, on spending. Uh, they're paying a uh, median of uh, two and a quarter times uh, revenue for their acquisitions. And we have a, a new kid in the game uh, that uh, I see as being uh, potentially a, a very sizable education uh, business. Uh, I've spoken with the head of acquisitions for Well North, and he seems to have a uh, complete view of education from pre-K on through to college, and uh, across all spectrums, across all subjects, across all areas. So I think Well North will be filling out their portfolio uh, with an a ongoing series of acquisitions, and they're going to be uh, a major player in, in this market. As to what the uh, valuation multiples have been, it's always a question I get. What do things, uh, what do businesses sell for? How are they valued? Uh, this slide shows a, a group of acquisitions of uh, mostly public companies. I think there's a couple of uh, private uh, transactions here. Uh, but starting at the top uh, with uh, McGraw-Hill, uh, Paula Global is getting it for 1.2 times uh, revenue. Um, the, I didn't have an EBITDA number uh, for uh, McGraw-Hill at the moment. So uh, down at the bottom in the footnote, it says that the operating profit is uh, $283 million at McGraw-Hill for the trailing 12 months, and that would put a multiple on that of about nine times, which uh, for a company the size of McGraw-Hill, I think is a terrific deal for Apollo. And there should be uh, significant cost savings uh, when you're uh, buying a, such a big division of a big company with its uh, ample uh, benefits programs and staffing uh, not being usually as uh, tightly uh, focused as uh, perhaps uh, your own companies. Um, so I, I think getting this deal at uh, nine times operating profit will turn out to be uh, very attractive for Apollo Global. Plato Learning, as uh, I mentioned, uh, through Toma Bravo bought Archipelago and uh, was paid a high multiple on revenue four times and a pretty healthy multiple on EBITDA at 14. Uh, Mira Funds bought Renaissance Learning. As you can see there, it was about three and a half times revenue, 12 times uh, EBITDA. Providence buying Blackboard for four times revenue, 19 times uh, EBITDA. Uh, Pearson buying Connections Academy. It was a large deal, 400 million at uh, two times revenue. Uh, News Corp uh, picking up wireless generation at a much discussed uh, valuation of 
nearly seven times uh, revenue, um, which has been kind of a high watermark in terms of uh, revenue multiples that I've seen for education transactions. And uh, Tom O'Bravo back in 2010 buying Plato for 2.2 times. So you can see the median is about three and a half times revenue and 14 times EBITDA multiple, but I would not apply this uh, right to your company. These are for uh, the largest uh, transactions, the most attractive transactions. Um, generally, the deals we work on can range anywhere from five to 10 times EBITDA. So that would be more the range that um, uh, could be anticipated for a more average uh, performing company under 25 million in revenue. So with that, uh, I'd like to, oh, I do have one thing. Be, I'm gonna ask Diana to go next, but I, there was this cute article in the New York Times, I don't know if you saw it, about Murdoch um, last week. I'm just gonna start out by reading the first uh, few paragraphs. Just take a minute. The media conglomerate uh, News Corp, which has been on its heels for more than a year because of the phone hacking scandal in Britain, <laughs> is looking to make acquisitions again. Uh, first on the list could be a 49% stake in the Yes Network, a purchase that could aid in the formation of a new nationwide sports network, and, and they did in fact do that. The News Corporation stock has reached highs as the company prepares to transfer its underperforming publishing assets into a separate publicly traded entity. One of the crucial factors in the decision was, the split, was that the split would allow Rupert Murdoch to buy into businesses he loves without upsetting investors who are more interested in cable and broadcast. In potential targets, it says, include the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, and important for this meeting, and more education companies. Rupert has his mojo back, said Todd Junger, a media analyst at Sanford Bernstein. The stock is up, investors are happy with the company's recent decisions. He is definitely rubbing his hands together, a person with knowledge of News Corp's deal-making discussions, said of Mr. Murdoch. So we'll find out uh, if he is rubbing his hands together or not now. Um, I've had a slight change on our oops, panel, so I'm going to go through this rather quickly because we're going to um, decamp to conversation so that Atif and I can um, join, join in the conversation together. But just, I thought quickly, um, given I stayed up and prepared this presentation, that I would give you just a quick overview of how we're thinking about the market at Amplify and then what we're trying to do at Amplify. Um, so with that, so little context for how we think about things. Um, this is probably no news to many of you in the room, but we, education in the last 30, 40 years has been characterized by high spend and low performance. And that low performance comes out um, in both domestic measures, which you see here on your left-hand side of the screen. So proficiency around eighth graders, high school rates, uh, sorry, graduation rates of our high schoolers um, career ready or college readiness of those who do graduate and then our graduation rates at the college level. These are disappointing grades to say the least and if you look in the graph on the right of the screen you can also see that um, in terms of international proficiency scores on math and reading well our spending is going up tremendously, our, our student performance has not, at least measured by those scores. We can debate whether those are accurate scores or not, but they are a benchmark that we have. So what's happening in this market? Uh, we have, Barry pointed out some of the drivers that are coming from the sort of larger macro financial industry sector. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening in the education context specifically. As we have heard mentioned um, many times today, Common Core Standards are coming in 2014. Currently 45 states have agreed to adopt those. Um, and these are largely, if not exclusively, in response to some of these poor measures that I showed on the first slide. With the arrival of Common Core Standards comes not only um, heightened accountability and demand for more rigorous content and higher order thinking skills, as Kareem mentioned earlier, but also it um, will have an effect, and I'll go a little bit into this in a second, on some of the reduced fragmentation of what the education market is for us right now. Additionally, the teaching force is changing. Um, 
the generation, there's a generation of millennials that are coming in to take, to take over some of the um, slots that are being made available through retirement. Um, if my memory serves me, 25 years ago, we had somewhere less than a quarter of our teaching force under 50, and we currently have 40% of our teaching force at that rate. Um, in addition to some of the graying and greening that's happening in that teaching force, we know from recent surveys, not done by us, but by other outfits out there, that with the arrival of new teachers, they are more open to um, some of the use of technology and some of the data-driven data and differentiated instruction techniques. Um, that some of us have talked about earlier today. Also, unsustainable economics continue to loom for districts and states. These are difficult times, as with other industries, when faced with um, having to do more with less, often technology becomes a leverage. We see through our own market research, as well as that of other outfits, that this is there is an appetite, or at least a willingness, to think about how can technology be adopted, again, not to replace teachers, but to augment and offset some of the administrative costs that we see um, burdening schools today. And finally, alongside that, as, as uh, schools and districts and states become more constrained, some of the tech solutions that are coming into play and being very recently adopted, only as early as 2010 specifically, I'm thinking of tablets, um, those prices are going down at, you know, quite dramatically in 2010, the average tablet was over $500 as projected by Business Insider and Gartner. By 2015, the average tablet will be under $300. Just something to think about. So what are the implications? So for the market specifically, uh, we've seen this map again a couple times today, 45 states. For the first time with this, in addition to having high quality standards that are shared across states for all kids everywhere, we also have an opportunity for those on the provider side to sell into a national market rather than selling state by state or district by district or even more challenging for all of us school by school. Um, this is a large market. I don't need to review the numbers. Most of you have um, heard them. But let's just throw one out there. There's $673 billion spend in K through 12 right now. 2010, 2011, a portion of that, approximately 40 billion, goes to uh, third-party pr um, products and services. That is likely to expand at a rate, probably somewhere in the range of three and a half kgar over 10 years. Um, what else is happening? Digitization. Again, don't need to revisit this. Everybody's talked about this today. I think it's um, no one's arguing that it's coming. We may have differences of opinion about what it should look like or what its effects will be. Um, this is a map that New Schools Venture Fund produced in 2011 to show some of the diversi diversification, excuse me, specifically of the education technology field. You can get this map, and it's interactive. You can get it on their site. I just wanted to use it as an anchor because I think it's actually quite, quite good as a preliminary roadmap to some of the things we saw happening. So um, New Schools Venture Fund broke it out into four buckets. There's curriculum, there's instructional systems or tools, data systems, and talent management. Um, my modification to that, and I would add distribution as being an important new um, pocket within this, this field. And so then I wanted to take another look at that and talk about going up a level and maybe relabeling a little bit with my own um, monikers, if you will, about what I think is happening, and not me alone, others smarter than myself talk about convergence happening in this field. In the media industry, we saw convergence, and it was um, largely characterized by the three Cs. There was uh, communications, content, and computing. Um, and this uh, little graphic that I did. I'm not a graphic designer, as you can tell by this. Um, we have, I put in five buckets because I was working off of what was the New Schools Venture Fund map. Um, we see a convergence of content and curriculum, distribution, delivery, instructional tools, professional services, and data and analytics. And these are, in this graph, all represented equally. We can debate that. I think that um, there are certain large, certainly large cap providers in some of those buckets and a lot of startups and others. And I think there's a question around consolidation, which we can take up in our conversation, as to what's going to happen in this, what is a very, very bimodal market, even in a state of convergence. So with that, I just want to talk very briefly about what Amplify is trying to do. Um, you know, we launched our new brand. We were made a division of News Corp officially 
in 2011, let me get my calendar right, and we launched the new brand and became an independent subsidiary of the family in uh, July of this year named Amplify. We're dedicated to reimagining K-12 education specifically right now um, by focusing on digital products and services that address and empower teachers, students, and parents. We're trying to bridge the in-school and out-of-school. We have three units. Amplify Insight, which is uh, the wireless generation core business that was referenced um, in, in Barry's presentation. That's what was acquired in 2010. That focuses on analytics, um, assessment and intervention, professional services, and enterprise data systems. I can answer any questions about this later, but I will just go quickly. Um, we've stood up two new businesses since the acquisition, or we are standing up two new businesses. One is called Amplify Learning, that's our new content and curriculum business. And then our uh, distribution and delivery business, ta tablet-based platform, is Amplify Access. Just a quick status update on these three businesses. So Amplify Insight, the, the traditional core business of wireless generation, was founded in 2000. Again, acquired in 2010. We serve well over 200,000 teachers, 3 million students, and we're in all five states, including 40% of the uh, largest top 200 school districts. Amplify Learning has been, is the incubation of the new curriculum business. This is, be, this is being incubated at Wireless Generation. This began in 2011. Um, In-school pilots began this month. We are working with a variety of partners, including, for example, Lawrence Hall of Science, Lapham's Quarterly, and Shell Games. Amplify Access, as I said, is the tablet form is the tablet platform business. Excuse me. Also began in 2011, and also currently beginning at school-based pilots right now. Um, we announced at the time of the branch of uh, the brand launch, excuse me, a collaboration with AT&T, and we are targeting a fall 2013 uh, commercial launch for this particular product. We have a variety of third-party content providers ranging from those in the OER category, such as CK12, those in more traditional content publishers, larger cap, like Encyclopedia Britannica, and then also some of the Learning 2.0 instructional tools like Project NOAA. These are just examples, but just to give you a, a sense. And so, um, I am not going to talk at length about this and leave it for question, but going back to that graphic, I wanted to talk about a little bit, Barry asked me to mention a little bit about our merger and acquisition strategy. And um, to date, we've done, you know, News Corp has done, obviously, the, the major acquisition of wireless generation, and since that happening, we've had one public small um, publicly announced small acquisition by wireless generation in the um, instructional tools category. Prior to that, there's been an acquisition by wireless generation in the content and curriculum area. We've looked at a number of acquisitions, to be honest, since I arrived in the summer of 2011, and some small, some very large. And uh, we have backed away from many of the acquisitions to date largely because what we're trying to do is we have an opportunity to build from the bottom up, and so we are thinking hard about our own organic growth and product development. And I put P and C up there because that doesn't mean that we are building at all in isolation. In fact, a big part of our strategy is working in partnership and, and in collaboration over merger and acquisition. So we can talk about that in our, as we proceed. Thank you. So from here, I thought we'd go more Q&A, and I'd like to give Atif a chance to uh, go first here and talk about uh, Renovus' uh, new uh, SBIC slash private equity group, and, uh, but he comes with a great deal of experience from Leeds Equity and having done uh, some very sizable transactions in education. So Atif, you want to just uh, give us an overview of you know, why education is of particular interest to you. Sure. Um, and a lot of that would not come as a surprise to this audience. Education for us as investors is a very attractive area because it's large. The way we look at it, it's second only to the healthcare sector, $1.3 trillion, uh, and it is growing. It's grown even in the most recent Great Recession. It's grown over the past 40 plus years, each and every year. And it is critical to the success of both individuals and the society 
uh, overall at a micro level what we like in terms of the opportunities we see we focus on smaller end of the the market businesses that have two to five million of uh, EBITDA maybe a bit uh, bigger too uh, there these are the businesses uh, that have good growth prospects uh, are mostly founder owned uh, where we see a clear path to taking the businesses uh, to the next level uh, within the education space uh, we think of ourselves as generalists we go wherever there is opportunity so historically we've invested in direct providers of education meaning career colleges k-12 schools corporate training businesses as well as businesses that provide products and services to uh, the education providers and there i would put uh, educational technology first and foremost and we find that to be a very attractive area uh, because technology as Baron you mentioned tends to be very scalable uh, a lot of these technology businesses have recurring revenues uh, and good growth prospects uh, but especially in the education space since the customer itself tends to be a very stable customer uh, in most cases it's able to raise prices on its customers like uh, colleges always raise tuition that gives these service providers a pricing umbrella as well and recurring uh, revenue so that lends itself well to investing in the technology space within education and the kind of technology we like is really mature back-end type technology we don't do bleeding and uh, bleeding edge consumer uh, technology because that uh, in our view first gives us an opportunity to really apply the traditional private equity diligence metrics to those type of uh, uh, opportunities and secondly if the market changes it changes at a slow pace the traditional institutions tend to be slow in uh, adopting new new methods so as a service provider uh, it, it gives you time to react and respond to changes uh, uh, taking place Another thing I would say that is different about Renovus Capital Partners is that even though we are solely focused on making investments in the education space, we are structured as a small business investment company, uh, which means that we are licensed by the U.S. federal government. Two-thirds of our funding comes from the, uh, the federal government at highly uh, subsidized rate, which allows us to pursue um, buyout strategy of small businesses without taking on company level leverage so it's a big competitive uh, advantage in our view that we can do transactions and compete in processes <coughs> and speak for the entire capital structure uh, that allows us higher uh, degree of certainty and expedited timing and in some cases allows us to get transactions done at le lower valuation because in this market uh, of smaller buyouts, uh, the ability to provide uh, no financing out type of offer has a, uh, has a great advantage. Okay, that's very important if you're uh, uh, um, selling your company and planning to go with the business, you don't want it to be so over leveraged uh, by a private equity fund acquisition that the business has no room to grow, so that's important. I was going to ask Atif also to maybe talk about some of your sample investments. I know since you formed Renovus, you've invested in Atomic Learning, which is uh, just comment on why you invested in that business and maybe just talk about what uh, what attracted you to it and uh, maybe just touch on some of the other education transactions you've done. Sure. Uh, as I mentioned that our uh, mandate within the education space is quite broad. So currently we have three portfolio companies. Uh, uh, the first one actually is a company called Edic College, which is a Puerto Rico-based provider of healthcare oriented one to two year programs uh, that lead to job placement upon graduation. So while a lot of people have moved away from making investments in the for-profit sector, uh, we have a point of view on businesses that would continue to do well in the current funding and the regulatory environment. And uh, the school that we invested in falls in that category uh, where uh, even in the current environment that school would do well. The reason is uh, even though um, the, the Puerto Rican schools have the same exact 
uh, accreditation standards, and they're approved by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, the, uh, the tuition levels in Puerto Rico are uh, less than half of what they are in the U.S. So, for example, uh, a two-year nursing degree in the U.S. would cost a student fifty thousand uh, dollars. The same exact degree uh, approved by the same exact accreditor would cost uh, less than twenty thousand. And the biggest difference is, in order to finance that college education, um, some eighteen to twenty-year-old female would have to take thirty to forty thousand dollars of college loans in the U.S. In Puerto Rico, because most of our students tend to be from low-income areas, they qualify for federal grants called the Pell Grants, and they graduate debt-free. Uh, so it's a great uh, ROI for the student. Uh, the business we invested in has done really well in a smaller market in Puerto Rico and has great margin. So there is proof of concept, great reputation. So our investment thesis there is to take that business and expand it to uh, other geographies, first in Puerto Rico and hopefully one day in the U.S. So that's at a college, uh, a for-profit college education deal, uh, which doesn't have any of the negative attributes that get discussed uh, in the press. The second investment is the one that you mentioned, um, Atomic Learning, uh, which is a provider of um, uh, online content uh, for, uh, for teachers in the K-12 space, uh, uh, for the professional development as well as uh, uh, post-secondary and now increasingly in the, in the consumer space. So this small business uh, that we acquired, again, has recurring revenues because it has uh, relationships with most of the uh, K-12 districts uh, in the U.S., expanding into the post-secondary uh, uh, school market uh, and uh, a growing presence uh, in uh, uh, in international markets uh, such as uh, Australia. What we liked about the business was in addition to having uh, a subscription based model that uh, lends itself to recurring revenue, uh, they are the low cost provider uh, of this type of uh, uh, online uh, content and uh, PD training uh, for, uh, for the teachers. And uh, uh, Affordability is one of the key themes that we are following uh, at our firm. Uh, the second one is increasing efficiency, and this uh, business uh, 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 allows for both. The third investment that we have recently made is a business called uh, the Ariel Group, which provides uh, leadership and communication training uh, for high performers, uh, both uh, in academic institutions and uh, and, uh, uh, and at leading uh, firms. So uh, this business, uh, which was established over 10 years ago, um, has uh, done the, the difficult job of getting into the most prestigious accounts. Uh, their uh, leadership training is taught now at Harvard Business School, at Dartmouth, at Duke, and at leading uh, consulting firms such as uh, BCG, Booz Allen, um, Bain and some uh, corporate accounts uh, such as PNG. So the opportunity we see here is to uh, further expand the programmatic offering beyond just the core uh, leadership to uh, other verticals such as uh, uh, sales training uh, and uh, incorporate uh, some of their um, uh, leadership and communication aspects to uh, to the sales training uh, vertical. So, so that's a, yeah. a, a portfolio right now. We are very active in the marketplace, uh, would continue to do three or four acquisitions a year. Right. Uh, so we have a few minutes uh, for questions. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I guess market forces, I would be my, as I'm trying to think off the top of my head here, and think about what happened to the other companies that were you know, big in education. They did not uh, pursue acquisitions. Um, McGraw-Hill did not, uh, and Simon & Schuster got bought by Viacom, so you know, Viacom was not interested in education. Um, so uh, I think, and then Harcourt got caught up with its uh, debt issues. So I, I think the, the 
main factor is that the other big players stopped uh, doing acquisitions for uh, various reasons, were not able to keep up, and, and therefore now are way behind. Do you have uh, any other? Yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's accurate. I would also say um, Amplify, as I alluded, we, you know, we made a strategic decision in the last year or so that um, for, for us, given the opportunity we have, which is an unusual one, we don't have you know, a lot of legacy business, particularly I'm thinking in the content area that we need to convert, which is a luxury, um, but it's also a challenge, frankly. Um, we made a decision that organic growth was the right strategy for product development in that space particularly, and that we, um, that doing a roll-up was not, not the right way for us to go given the opportunity we had. Then I would just say in a larger market condition, um, you know, m prior to coming to, to Amplify, I ran a very, very small not-for-profit accelerator that focused on this space, and I worked with a lot of startups. and. Um, when I look at, when I hear the valuations at startups come to me now, I mean, pre-revenue, pre-sales, I mean, pre-product, um, <laughs> you know, they have a very nice deck. You're and, very particular. <laughs> <laughs> and I think of what that valuation is, and I think, there's, you know, for, when I think about the transaction costs, the integration costs, all of that, and what actually is the f real actual value of that company out in the market, we're just not in a place where it makes, spe it makes sense. And I think just as a, a note, so going back to my mention of a very bimodal m market, I look out now and I think we have, a, you know, the startups end of the scale is extremely overinflated in my humble opinion, and the large cap, um, side of the market as demonstrated by yesterday's news is undervalued. And so what's going to happen in this space is my question for all these startups. What is the exit strategy for these guys? You know, if I'm a venture capitalist six or eight months from now and some very nice um, startup comes to me and says, you know, I want, I think I'm worth $10 million and I want this much for, you know, this much of your money for this much of my business and a venture capitalist says, and what's your exit strategy? Who's acquiring, to your point? You know, I don't think IPOs are really um, on the roadmap for a lot of these companies. So what is it? Is it the private equity route? I just don't understand what happens here. So it's more a question than an observation. Do we have time for one more? Or one more question. Andy? If you were to give advice to a service company that wanted to position itself for um, acquisition one day, right. um, how do you think Service different way. I think it's kind of inherent in what Atif was saying about one of the companies that he's back already, the Aerial Group. It's a service company. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason he's backing the, the service company is because they have a long term uh, client relationships with some blue chip clients. So uh, building up a, a form of renewal business, uh, in other words, if you're dealing with the same schools or the same districts or the same states, um, or the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or, or some agency on an ongoing basis where you can so uh, that would be highly important to the, the service aspect. Okay. Right. okay thank you very much. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, both of you, all three of you.